program talking about trends for the next 12 months. My guest is Gerald Salante from Rhinebeck, New York. Gerald is one of today's pioneers in trend strategy. He founded the Trends Research Institute in Kingston, New York, and is the publisher of the Trends Journal that has been going on since 1980. And he's been one of the nation's most accurate diagnosticians and forecasters. And uh, for the past five years, Gerald's come on at the end of every year uh, to look at the next 12, uh, 12 months and see what is likely to be happening. Nice to have you with us today, Gerald. Thank, thank you for having me, Gary. And it was great being uh, up in uh, Rosendale to um, be with you with uh, on, on Skype with uh, Poverty, Inc. What a great, great movie. If anyone hasn't seen it, they're missing something that has been put together with so many different aspects of life coming from so many different directions that no one else has done. So I congratulate you for doing that, and I'm honored to be a part of it. It's exceptional, and it's the story of America today. We've gone from the strong middle class to a dollar store society, and you really put it together in a, in a great way and offer solutions as well that we can have a more uh, prosperous future, not prosperous only in terms of money, but in morality. So thank you very much. I appreciate those kind words. Thank you, Gerald. Gerald, I, I want to go through a lot of different topics today. Uh, if we can, and I have about 20, so if we can keep it succinct, that would be great. Let's start with the idea that we are not using sound economic principles. They're being subverted to favor the wealthy and powerful. Could you give us examples of what that will mean in the next year? It's, it's very simple. We're, they have, the Federal Reserve has not raised interest rates since 2006. The only thing it's done is propped up the equity markets. In the old days, people could put money in banks, have savings accounts, and get interest. That was above the inflation rate. You can't do that anymore. So when you look at the equity markets and who has profited from it, it's from the banks and from the brokerage firms and from the stockholders, uh, stock companies, for example. Most of the equity market boom has gone from companies buying back their stock because they could borrow money so cheaply. Number two, we call it bankism, not capitalism. Too big to fail, kill capitalism. Bankism means these major banks are borrowing money at 0.25% and then loaning it to us at usury rates up into, you know, you can make up whatever number you want into the 100%. Number three, private equity groups and hedge funds and venture capitalists are also responsible for building the equity markets. They've done more deals in 2014 than they did in – it's back down up to 2007 levels. So only the rich are benefiting, and I don't throw that out as just a, a line. The Pew Research study came out a week and a half ago and showed that the gap between the rich and the poor in the United States now – even surpasses that of the Gilded Age, and 85 people around the world have as much money as 3.25 billion. Price wars is a big issue. There's more surplus of product than there is demand, and that's going to result in a change in retail marketing. Again, all things are connected. So when we look at the concentration of wealth in the hands of so few, the other people don't have money to buy so much of what's been produced. And as you me mentioned, there's an overproduction and there's overcapacity. So here's what we're looking at. As oil prices now are going down and people want to make it look like it's a conspiracy theory to overthrow Putin and to destabilize Venezuela, it's bigger than that. Some 20% of the junk bonds in the United States, for example, are energy-related. And this is global, by the way, into the trillions of dollars. They're going to take a huge hit. So it's not only oil that's at, 
at five and a half year lows. It's copper, it's iron ore, it's, it's corn, and it's the products you're buying at the store. Again, many of us are old enough to remember that they didn't have sales until after the Christmas holiday, and now it's 70% off before. So there's too much capacity, too much production, and too few people with enough money to buy what's out there. So you're going to start seeing more and more price pressure. But having said that, you're not going to see it show up in your, in your everyday life because, for example, in the food industry, it's owned by a very few. So they could control the prices. The supermarkets are owned by a very few. So you won't feel it as much as you should in terms of paying less at the cashier. Okay. The demise of mainstream media, and as more people turn to alternative media sources, none of this is reported. Major media, I believe, will be forced to downsize and provide less authentic news and information and more entertainment. Exactly. They have already. Our CEO, his name is Derek Osinenko. He's an icon in the, in the, in the business. He was the editor-in-chief of Gannett News. This is Mr. Inside. And he will tell you, the first to tell you, that he was also running a, a chain of Rupert Murdoch's uh, Dow Jones papers uh, under, under that group as well. And he's left, of course, he's with us. There's no feet on the beat. Everything has been consolidated. As you well know, what is it, six media companies control the, the entire operation in the United States thanks to the deregulation under Bill Clinton and the Federal Communications Act. So what do we have? What they're doing in the newspaper business, if you live in Seattle or Sea Caucus and you have a local paper, it's going to look almost identical. It's all being scripted out of a central location. There are no feet on the beat. These are owned by hedge funds, and all they're interested in is the bottom line. The other side of this, it's a great opportunity to bring back the family newspapers and the newspapers for the 21st century. The demand is there, but the, the money junkies who have bought up all these newspapers, they're only, cons they're only interested in finding, getting as much profit as they can and not producing reporting. So there's an opportunity to rebuild the fourth estate because it's not going to come from the majors. It's cartoon news network. Let me just focus a little more on that. Today, the latest ratings came out, which showed that Fox television had an increase of 1% to about 1.2 million uh, viewers, that CNN was way down uh, second, and uh, MSNBC had dropped substantially, almost a 22% drop. They had about 400, 440,000, um, so they're way down. Now, think of that for a moment. We have 300 nearly 320 million people in the United States. Those three together, Fox, CNN, and MSNBC together, only have about 2 million viewers. And they're always looking for a particular demographic. And Fox's average viewer is 72 years of age. And CNN is old. Then again, one of our sister stations, WBAI, is 70 years of age, the average listener. No one is paying attention to what other media are doing. And I think that is very relevant because unbeknownst to all the mainstream media, there's a different universe altogether. You're connected to that, Gerald. We're connected. And I just want to give you some of the figures on that. Uh, let's see if we have Jason uh, in studio now because uh, he, has, uh, he has the latest figures. Now, mind you, we, we just got these figures this morning. This is for the last 12 months. These are people who are reading articles, and we're posting almost 200 different articles per 24 hours. Videos, documentaries, calls to action, plus the radio programs. Jason, uh, Jason's in studio now. Hi, Jason. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good, just pot up the mic. Jason, give us the latest figures. I think Gerald would be interested in the last 12 months uh, of figures that you have. Well, just just uh, over the last 12 months, just we hit under on Facebook just under 
Three hundred million people. We were at two eighty nine, six hundred and three thousand one hundred and eighty four people who have shared our post, who have went to our post, who have sent them to other friends, who have shared them with around the world. So that's an excellent figure for us. And then also on YouTube, seeing your different movies and documentaries. Again, this is just our one source. We're not going to all the sources because we're not going to go through that. You have over three million views of Seeds of Death, War on Health. Just this year, Joy of Juicing, all those movies that you put up for free to let people see. So that's an amazing statistic as well. And then just covering the podcast, just our podcast for the last year. This is just one year. Again, how many people have downloaded our different podcasts? We've had over 4,991,733 different people download a podcast this year from one of our many great shows. We have 85 of them. So that's a great, great accomplishment. So there you have it. Nearly over a quarter of a billion Nearly 300 million, and you don't hear a word about that. And what is that? And this is what's really remarkable. Jason, what is the average age? Average age? 35 to 44 college educated women who, uh, who just want to know about to help their families and make a better world. That's right. These are the people who are sharing. They're in the demonstrations. They're the ones who are belonging to movements. They're the ones who are pushing for change. They're the ones engaging in change. They're the largest group becoming vegans. They're the ones who are more interested in closing down nuclear power plants. So unbeknownst to those 72% uh, 72-year-olds out there, uh, th- there's a whole legions of young vitalist people making positive changes and there's not a single word about any of them anywhere so i thought you'd like to know that any thoughts on that please? yeah that's excellent it's great and, and you really summed it up the opportunity for positive change is there and it's starting to happen and it's starting to build look when you look at trends are born they grow they mature reach old age and die those of us are old enough, we don't even have to be that old, to remember that really this whole Internet revolution only began around 1994, 20 years ago. So we're only in the early growth stages. They are going to become the major media insignificant. The only problem right now with it is that they still have the major voice to sway the general public. Just as you saw, and again, I don't want to go into a lot of time because I know time is short. Just as you saw what happened when Obama pulled the dog and pony show trick with the Sony baloney thing about how, you know, North Korea hacked this and our freedom and liberty was at stake and the country bought it. So what I'm saying is the major media still can use the power of the presidency and the public office to direct the general public. And that's what really has to change. Okay. Now, after I reviewed the different trends for the next 12 months, I observed two different impulses heading in different directions and at odds with each other. So I'd like to have you look at these two trajectories holistically and then explore the outcome of where we might be headed in the year ahead and beyond. On the one hand, there is business as usual among the wealthy, powerful elites who have every intention to continue to steer its current course, more monopolistic mergers, regressive international trade agreements favoring the plutocracies, which further undermine the populist national interest a corporate media enslaved, as you mentioned, to, I think you said six media control 70% of all of the information, and they're going to do more of that to private and government propaganda promotion and a banking and financial system that deludes itself in the myth of perpetual growth and progress. And then on the other side of the railroad tracks, from the bottom up are the progressive movements that are succeeding in increasingly alternative energy sources, younger professionals, encouraged by higher ideals to be more creative and generate business models outside the conventional corporate box, and more and more people awakening the fact that mainstream media is more fluff and completely unreliable in conveying facts. When we look at this scenario, we discover two radically different future trends underway that are diametrically opposed. So my big question is, where do they meet? What is the conflict that will result in the gap between them and Will it be class war? Will, will, do, you see, do you see that we're in enough pain to go to the streets, or is it still 
we need more pain and more suffering, or an aggressive attempt by the rich and powerful to finance and, and, and finance business and government to wipe out innovation and new and creative uh, impulses that go against the grain of the status quo, will the trend lead to a restoration of democracy, or are we traveling towards postmodern fascism? We're already in fascism. Fascism, by definition, is the merger of state and corporate powers. And when you look at our three top trends among them, uh, manipul- grand manipulation, the r- rigging all the markets, Forex, LIBOR, gold. The facts are there. It's not even worth discussing. They're all there if anybody wants to look at it. It's not a conspiracy theory. They only find the banks. Nobody does time. Bankism, again, in, 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 uh, in capitalism, there's no such thing as too big to fail. It's bankism or record low interest rates, not only in the United States. They have negative interest rates in Europe, and you see what's going on in, in, uh, in China. They're juicing the markets over there through the banks, and especially, of course, in Japan. So what's the third element of the fascism? It's they're watching everything that we do. They are totally tuned into our lives. So the modern fascism is already here. Will it change? It's tricky to say because we're seeing the changes come about with the demonstrations. And you well know from reading our Trends Journal, we did a story, Cops Gone Wild, long before uh, Ferguson. As a matter of fact, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, former Assistant Treasury Secretary under Reagan, wrote it for us. So the, so the militarization of the police is another aspect of that. But now you're seeing the counter moves to it. And again, we have to look globally. Look what's going on in Sweden. Third party coming up, they're trying to push it down. Same thing UKIP in in England. The same thing with Le Pen's party in France. The same thing with in Belgium. Every country virtually in Europe has a new strong third party. So what are the counterbalances? One of the ways I made my name in trend forecasting, when I wrote trend tracking back in the mid-80s, and I predicted a new third party. And for some reason, I mentioned Ross Perot. And, of course, he ran in 1992. If you want to know what can change this country more than anything, it's a real presidential candidate. I call it progressive libertarian. Progressive in the terms of the things that you talk about and what I believe as well, and libertarian in the sense that, no, government, we need regulations, so a combination of the two, but getting government out of our life. The time has never been better for it now. Never, never in my lifetime in following these trends, and I've been doing it since 1980, has the condition been better for a new third party. What are we looking toward? A, a, another Bush and another Clinton? You can't make this stuff up. So what I'm saying is they could also redirect our our freedoms by a terrorist strike, be it false flag or real, because you see how people line up when the president comes out there and says we're under attack and we have to lose more of our rights, as we saw under Bush and Obama keeps doing. So it's up to the people. And there's no, I don't know what's going to be the flashpoint one way or another, but I do believe that the human spirit right now has never had a greater opportunity to direct us into a new future that's far greater than what we're living in and what we see coming ahead. And and, and the millennials, by the way, one of our big trends is retrograde. And when we were growing up, the future was always going to be better than the present or the past. Now the young people are looking at it and just looking at the future, and they're saying it's going to be worse. Well, so what com- they're doing is they're going to the past to bring it forward. I also think that the millennials have Anonymous on their side as a way of challenging, to the degree they can, uh, those that have gone against the public interest. And I believe, my belief is that Ninety percent of the American public will never do anything in their entire life except consume. But those who have been of consciousness, some older, mainly younger, will challenge them. Now, that said, when you look at one of the biggest issues today, the falling price of oil, is it possible that the United States, working with Saudi Arabia, 
is trying to to bring down the ruble, crush the Russian economy, uh, and still uh, install NATO on Russia's border in the Ukraine, and in effect perpetuate a constant new Cold War because of the thousands of private uh, contracting corporations, the millions of people who would be getting money, and the American public paying for all this, uh, is, is that one of the causes of this uh, right now low price in oil? And what do you see happening to oil in the next year? No, I really don't think it's one of them. As I mentioned, we have 20% of our junk bonds in this country are in the energy-related field. Chevron has pulled out of the deal in Ukraine, and so is Shell. The money's not there anymore, and they're not finding the, the, the fracking riches that they thought in the, in the early explorations in Poland and other areas. I, this is much bigger than that. And as I see it, as I said, this is an oversupply of product. China is responsible for over 15% of the decline in oil prices because they were the biggest consumers. So it's not only, it's not only Russia and it's not only oil. You're looking at Angola. You're looking at Nigeria. You're looking out to Bolivia, Chile. Copper prices are way down. Australia. You go up to Canada. The tar sands aren't viable anymore to extract oil from it at the price levels that they're at. This is much bigger. It's out of control. You know, one of, I, I mentioned Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. There's no one I respect more in, in geopolitics and economics than him. Again, former Assistant Treasury Secretary under Reagan, a man that could and did have the power to bring in the director of the CIA and question him under oath. I said to him, Craig, I said, I'm looking at Obama's national security team. I said, well, it's a joke. I said, are there people behind the scenes pulling strings? And he said, no, Gerald. What you see is what it is. Are there deals being made? Of course there are. So what I'm saying is what we see is what it is. The, the only person behind the screen is the Wizard of Oz, a decrepit old man and a little dog. My so when final, we look, my, I, I got it. My final question. Right now, what do you see the likely outcome of the dollar to be since right now the dollar is the strong currency uh, and yet we're pumping – trillions of dollars into printing more money through quantitative easing, and we have nothing to back it up, and we have $186 trillion in underfunded, unfunded, and debts in the United States. So at what point does this 18,000 number on Wall Street in, in commodities and the value of the dollar begin to be challenged, or does this bubble continue for another year? It's hard to say because the only reason the dollar's strong is but you mentioned the ruble and you mentioned that you could go on to the yuan, the loony, they're all the only reason the dollar's strong is because the other ones are so weak. Look at the euro. Was it trading at a dollar twenty one around now? So you, you, the dollar isn't strong. It's only strong compared to what's going on in the rest of the world, which again goes back to that's why I believe in gold. Why would I want bucks or any other currency? The only way – look at the new numbers that came out, Gary, today in, in November's uh, existing home sales and new home sales. They're virtually flat, and this is at mortgage rates at record lows. And what are you looking at in apartment rentals? The cost of those have gone uh, – they've gone up seven to a seven-year high. So what we're looking at is that – there's no money. They keep printing more of it. The only reason the dollar is strong is because the other currencies are so weak. And there's going to be, I believe, a financial panic at some point. And it's now in the making because the emerging markets emerged because of all of that cheap money that was flowing into them. And it's not flowing in anymore. Well, so what you're saying, and I just want to finish with this, that we could expect during 2015 to see a major correction? I believe there will be. It will be worse than the panic of 08 because now they have no other way to play it out. They can't dump more cheap dough into the system to prop it up. That game is over. So I think the worst is yet to come. Okay. 
Gerald, thank you very much for being on and, and sharing your insights with us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year to you and everyone listening. The Trends Journal at trendsresearch.com, Gerald Salante. By the way, tomorrow, to help our sister station, WBAI, I'll be doing a three-hour live special from noon to three and uh, going into a lot of different topics. You won't want to miss that tomorrow on WBAI, noon to three. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you for listening. Now let's say hello to you, uh, to Luann Panessi. Hi, Luann. Hello, Gary. Well, boy, how do you follow that? <laughs> I think that's the reason that every single person should be coming to your retreat in January, to regroup their head and wrap it around what's going on. Um, I've gotten a couple of emails here. Uh, a lot of people are talking about the option of homeschooling, Gary, because they're looking at the core curriculum and they're seeing how ridiculous it is, how it's dumbing down their kids. And there are people that have, you know, baccalaureate degrees, college degrees, that are writing letters to the teachers and to the superintendents of their schools saying that, you know, in the real world, there's a simple way to do mathematics, for instance. And they're making the core curriculum convoluted in such a way that, that kids are going to start to hate school and they're going to be just basically dumbed down. So people are asking what your opinion is on should we be doing more homeschooling and how do we challenge this whole core curriculum thing? That is too large a question to answer this quickly before our next program. I will do this. I do have a program coming up on the Progressive Comment Here Hour about rethinking our entire educational system. The best and worst of our public system, the best and worst of the private system, and the best and worst of homeschooling. All of that will be dealt with in depth. But I, I'm giving it a full hour, not a minute. Okay, okay. fair enough. All right. Now let's say hello to you, Trees. Hi, you, Trees. Hello, Gary. Happy New Year to you tomorrow, and good luck with the three hours that you're doing tomorrow. I look forward to hearing it. But today we're talking about the year 2015. We're on the cusp of a new year, and of course the Lead Stories listeners being the most accurate predictors of change ever on the planet, we will be talking about what's ahead. Great. Utrice Lee, right now, please stay with us. <laughs> 